You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Rob Carver and me, Nils Kastrolarsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of rules-based investors. For those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to keep you focused and inspired to continue your rules-based investing journey. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity to check out the back catalog and listen to the past episodes that you may have missed. Now, firstly, let me just say a really, really big thank you to those of you who took the time this week to leave a rating and review in iTunes. I noticed Patrick from the UK and then HDHFDUE and also DU Shock from the US. And we had Zara Soronia from uh, Australia. And uh, a lot of you left some great reviews. We're really grateful for this because they do help investors discover the podcast. That's how the algorithm works. And of course, for those of you who have not yet left the rating and review, shame on you. No, not really. But if you could take five minutes uh, of your time and, and do it now and then come back and hit the play button on today's episode. And to make it even easier for you, uh, just go to toptradersonplug.com forward slash review. And then you have all the instructions and links. And hopefully that is not too much to ask for as we get into our episode. But with that out of the way, it's time for me to say um, good morning to you, Rob. How are you doing? It's good to have you back. And are you out of quarantine yet? Or I'm not in No, sure. so um, yeah, I went to France for a couple of weeks on holiday, which was nice. But sadly, when I came back, we were told we had to quarantine for two weeks and it's pretty strict. So you're not allowed out of the house for any reason, even, even to go shopping. So you have to have your food delivered and, and, and stuff like that. So fortunately, we've, we've got a big garden. So um, my, my daughter this morning was, was walking around the garden, like trying to get her 10,000 steps. So we've kind of been reduced to doing that and, and you know, using exercise bikes and things like that for exercise. That, that's the thing I, I really miss because obviously I spend most of my time sitting in front of a desk anyway. So it hasn't affected me, me that much. But uh, yeah. But yeah. It almost sounds like the uh, movies you see when you see these prison yards and, and 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 the prisoners are just walking around in circles to get their exercise done. It's it's sad. Yeah. I mean, it's it really well, is sad. Yeah, we are where we are, I guess, in terms of the uh, the the virus. So yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to my introduction rant this morning. I am sure you're going to follow along just fine. I'm sure you've noticed what's happened in the last week or so. And this week was really, from my point of view, mostly about the Fed and a shift in its policy. Because on Thursday, Chairman Powell announced a shift to so-called symmetric inflation targeting. And this did not come out of the blue completely, but but still. So let's just focus on bonds for a change. The point of the speech was to announce that they are officially decoupling interest rates from the unemployment mandate. The question is, of course, why they do it and, and why now? And here's something I wrote this morning to my investors uh, as my part of my weekly update. And it goes something like this. Well, 20 straight weeks of 1 million plus first time unemployment or unemployed, a total of 54 million or so with rock bottom rates every step of the way. So basically, the rates are as low as they can be, and unemployment really hasn't budged much. Perhaps they feel that allowing the entire yield curve to go negative won't help, like Europe and Japan already tried. So, number one, they are stating the obvious unemployment cycles are not necessarily tied to interest rate cycles. And two, perhaps the talk about allowing inflation to run above 2% is just kind of cover talk what they may really actually be saying is that they will raise interest rates if the market demands it, despite whether high unemployment exists or not. What was interesting to observe was that most of the headlines on the day, so on Thursday, just focused on the fact that the Fed will keep rates low forever. This suggests that the Fed has control 
I'm not so sure they really do. When someone claims the Fed will keep rates low forever, they're really saying the Fed will keep bond prices high forever. And maybe bond prices will stay high for a while, but does that mean the Fed really have control over it? Particularly since the Fed is the biggest passive investor on the planet and announces what they will be buying more or less ahead of time. So let's think about it. Can bond prices stay high forever when the US is now running a $3.7 trillion deficit just this year alone? And will cutting that to $2 trillion next year help at this stage? Remember when people were scared of deficits? Remember back in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan? And he ran supposedly high deficits. Then came Ross Perot. He ran in the 1919 election for president on deficits and made a good showing. The U.S. had even a Tea Party not that many years ago that was focused on fiscal restraint. But now, nothing, absolutely nothing. Why? I think maybe we're all becoming numb to bonds because the bull market has gone on for 40 years. And they are issued by many countries uh, pretty much like candy without a care in the world. It's really quite amazing. Everyone is focused on the stock market as a barometer for things. And now every Robin Hooder is doing technical analysis and selling their services that we may be overlooking the real bear in the room. So it got me thinking as I saw article after article cautioning against the stock market is in a bubble. And it is. I've not yet seen any really good headlines talk about the bond market being in a bubble. And that's quite amazing. People associate interest rates so closely with inflation, stagflation, deflation, disinflation, that they forget that interest rates, really their, their real purpose is to manage the risk of issuing the loan, the bond in the first place. I lend you $1,000 cash. I want 10% interest in return. I take the risk lending the money to you and I lose the ability to use and invest that money. Therefore, I want to say $1,100 in return because you may default. Pretty simple. Well, that's all you really need to know. Nothing has changed. But now, at least in Europe, we go, can I lend you $1,000? And I think prices will be low for in the future. And therefore, you only need to pay me back a $950 in the future. Would you or I ever make a loan like this? Probably not. It's no different when it comes to governments auctioning off their debts and boatload. People buy it, taking a risk and yet demand hardly any yield in return. And they think there is absolutely no risk at all and demand no yield. Their mindset is trapped in the bond bubble. They may all be well aware of the stock bubble, but the entire planet is snoozing on the debt slash bond bubble. But it's coming, I think. So when I finally, and this is kind of the last part, I mean, I actually then did ask the people who do the cash management for for our funds, so not the investments of the funds, but just looking after the cash part of it. And I asked them about the Fed's latest move and what they said to me, and I'm, and I'm quoting, we weren't encouraged by Chairman Powell's comments yesterday. It strikes us as another stroke by the Fed in painting themselves into a corner. We much prefer the Fed to operate as an invisible hand instead of the celebrities they seem to want to be. So... Anyways, a bit of a rant, but why not? Because Morris is not here to keep us in control. Oh, no. Did you notice that, Rob? We, we can do whatever we want to. Yeah, we can I'm, even I'm trash enjoying, Bitcoin. Enjoying the freedom. Yeah, without yeah. The, the steady hand of the, the German. Kind of, uh... <laughs> but he is enjoying some holidays, so he will be back in a couple of weeks, of yeah, course. Yeah, good. We miss him, really. We're just saying that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, I've, I've read a few takes on this. So um, a lot of people have said it doesn't really matter. There's always been a disconnect between what central banks say is their target and what their target actually is. And actually, I did some work quite a while ago now, but I was looking at um, whether we could predict interest rates from inflation and unemployment numbers and GDP numbers. So those are three things that central banks either explicitly look at or probably look at when setting interest rates. And I found that even for the central banks, which at the time had no explicit kind of output goal. So they were focused purely on a, an interest rate goal. Even for those central banks, there was actually a very strong feedback coming in from the the, the economic side, so the, the GDP and the unemployment numbers. So that the banks said, oh, you know, 
we are only looking at interest rates, nothing else matters. Uh, sorry, at inflation, nothing else matters. Very strict kind of monetarist view. But actually, if you looked at their behavior and you you know, you know did the kind of uh, econometrics, you could see they were actually really secretly looking at a GDP and unemployment. And really, it was one of those secrets that's an open secret. Everyone knew that's what they were doing. So um, I've heard a few people say, well, this this is just PR. I've heard a few people say, kind of like you say, in terms of painting themselves into a corner, actually, central banks really ought to be careful of giving themselves too many rules, too many constraints, and they should be free to operate according to what, what's the best thing for, for the government in terms of issuing its debt, but also for the general economy at the time. It strikes me that, um, that that's what they're going to do anyway, right? And a lot of people spend time trying to understand how central bankers' minds work and what they're really thinking and kind of, you know, watching press conferences and trying to read between the lines and say, you know, oh, look, um, this guy had a different colored tie on this week. Um, maybe that has some significance and all, all this kind of crazy stuff. I mean, I know that the sort of cult of the central banker, if you like, which I guess arrived really in, in, in the early to mid 90s, was this idea that central bankers would be would sit on this kind of Olympian plane separate from political control with this very pure goal of just controlling inflation. And that then would give them credibility. And then people would believe that inflation would be under control and wouldn't be subject to political influences. That was a theory. And, and it worked during this so-called Goldilocks period. But certainly today, and probably for the last 10, 12 years since the, the great financial crash, we've been in a very different place. Do you think yourself that there is some truth to the point that maybe we are all talking about the wrong market you know we talk about bubbles in the equity market and of course we've seen a few of those right and, and maybe to some extent you could say well we haven't really seen at least in our trading careers right from say the 80s until now it's it's rare that you could say well i've really seen a big bond bubble because it's kind of it's been a correction and then it's come back but could we be at a point in time where actually the bubble we need to worry about. I think we all know and, and are aware of the amount of debt is enormous, right? But it kind of brushes off to some extent, I think, in the narrative. And I also, when, I, when, when we talk to a lot of the global macro people we talk to and other people, and certainly my own, I would say, observations uh, in the last 35 years has been bonds are typically more right than equities. As a guide, I mean, hmm. the, 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 interestingly enough, uh, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but that seems to be true. Maybe it's because people on Robin Hood aren't, aren't trading bonds. Well, I mean, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, th there is some of that. I mean, day trading is not bond trading, right? I mean, so, so yeah, there is definitely the retail side of things. But even the institutional side of things, you rarely hear about this. So so I, I just wonder, I mean, I think the the... the the point I was trying to to make from from the sources that I had read going into this morning was, yeah, I mean, maybe we are looking at the wrong market, and then we should be asking some questions, and we should certainly be asking us ourselves the question about: Is it a great idea to lend a thousand dollars and get a nine hundred and fifty dollars back? I mean, how many times do you want to make that bet? So, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think if you if you try and talk to people at parties about the stock market, like right now, people are interested, and that's generally true. But I, I can't think of a single time when, when you know, someone's walked up to me at a party and I've said, what do you do? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm a bond trader. And they've gone, oh, my God, that's so exciting. You know, it's so interesting. Do you think I should buy the sort of latest issue of, of the German 10-year Bund? Is, is that a good buy? That yeah. doesn't happen. And that's never happened. And um, I think um, in general kind of public discourse, people generally have always been focused on equities rather than bonds. People who do own, you know, control their own investments generally invest in equities. They don't really invest in bonds. Maybe nowadays, you know, they buy a few bond ETFs, but that's about it. It's difficult for me personally because my background has been in, in fixed income generally over the years. Nowadays, I trade everything, but um, back in the day, I was managing a fixed income portfolio. I've been thinking about this bond bubble for at least 10 years, maybe. Yeah. And um, I remember back in 2011, looking at US interest rates and thinking, Surely they can't go any lower, you know. And I, I can't remember what the ten year then was. Maybe it was about two and a half percent, and now it's sixty, seventy basis points, something like that. So you only have to look at Japan to see how low interest rates can go. And and you know, I remember thinking again, sort of nearly ten years ago, wow, it's not surely not possible for an interest rate to actually go negative. 
it's not possible for, say, Swiss euro dollar futures to trade above 100. And about two weeks later, they did. So I think never, well, never say never in terms of the bubble. I mean, I think there has been, there potentially is a bubble. And you look at the prices of the, the some European bonds. And interestingly, actually, if I look at my own portfolio performance last week, the big loss, uh, which I had on, on Thursday in, in reaction to these comments, wasn't so much in, say, euro dollars and US bonds. It was actually more in European bonds. It was in BTPs. It was in oats. So one of the interesting things about the way markets react to news is it's sometimes not what you expect. So, for example, um, when the, there was issues with the US debt ceiling, again, about 10 years ago, everyone expected the US bonds would get really hurt. But actually what happened was there was um, effectively a flight to safety effect and people sold risky assets and bought US bonds. So US bonds actually rallied on the news that the US potentially would, wouldn't be able to, to issue more, you know, to pay off its debt and, and would be closing down the government. And also at the time was going to be losing its high credit rating. So all these things that you thought would be bad for US bonds weren't. So I guess... As a value investor, I, I look at um, German bonds and think the price is crazy. As a futures trader, I look at them and think, well, there's still some positive carry there. There's still up with momentum. So my system is probably going to continue holding them. But. Right. So many things I want to unpack. And uh, since we have uh, a free card today, we can, we can again, <laughs> you know, scrap the usual uh, format and let's just go with this. Many things. First of all, I would say, from the conversations that I'm having at the moment with investors, potential investors, the risk in the fixed income markets is a much bigger concern, it seems, or it's at least I would say it's a really big concern, right? Secondly, I would just mention that certainly people who follow certain types of, of technical analysis, again, usually done on, on the on the equity side. And again, not because I subscribe to this particular methodology, but I think it is a, it is an easy way and it's very well publicized in terms of how it works. And that is Elliott Wave. A lot of people are familiar with Elliott Wave. And the people who kind of made Elliott Wave most popular, in particular Bob Prechter and, and his firm, and again, it's, this is by no means an endorsement of what they do, but they have been citing this massive top in, in equities kind of a 300-year cycle that should supposedly come to an end. And if it does, obviously, we should expect a long and and deep bear market and all of that. And that may still happen, of course, and, and so on and so forth. But I will say they've been saying that for a little while. So, And it will happen, of course, if you say it long enough. So anyway, but the other things I know from on occasion, you know, seeing their information is, of course, they're actually also expecting a low in yields, a major low in yields, right? And you could be certainly forgiven to think that that would make sense that you're getting a low in yields at the same time you're getting this massive high in bonds and then those two markets will actually fall together. And this is where the correlation and the 60-40 portfolio really can get into to, to, to trouble because we've been used to this offsetting correlation for a while now. The last 20 years, it's been really a perfect match. And those who just stayed with a 60-40 portfolio have done really well. But if you go further out the curve, and, and not the curve, but if you go further out in history, of course, the correlation between bonds and equities are not negative most of the time. It's positive most of the time. So you could certainly see a period of time where both bonds and, and stocks will, will go down in price at the same time which would be a major concern, I think, for a lot of investors who, you know, hope that there will always be some kind of protection in their portfolio should equities go down from their bond part. So I think all of these things tie in quite well. And 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 it is, you know, the, the big question is, you know, at what point do we go back to some kind of normality, you know, normalcy? Uh, because to me, at least, it, it seems... It seems a little bit, you know, not just, you know, in some markets you could say it's not just a bubble, it's like a mania. We're back in, you know, whether it's Tesla or almost, I wouldn't say Apple necessarily, but Tesla is one example of that. And I, I wonder if we're going to look back maybe five, ten years ago and view things like Tesla as, oh yeah, how could you be so silly to buy Tesla at $2,200 and then see it drop to 500 again or, or, or whatever. So... 
I think we're living at a really interesting time. It's obviously completely impossible to time things. That's why we do trend following. We're not trying to time anything. We're just trying to get the bulk of the trend, so to speak, never buy the low or never sell the high, but just want to participate. But, but I just think for from every week, uh, we we see new things that, that are suggesting that some kind of regime shift could occur. And, and for the Fed to give up some of their normal targeting and attempts and essentially saying they're going to allow inflation to run hot for a while, thinking that they can completely control it when they want and say, oh, now we're at 3%, let's take it down to 2 Well, it doesn't work like that. They've clearly shown that they can't control, they couldn't get inflation up, so why do we think they can get it down? I don't think they can. So, Yeah, it's interesting because I guess most bubbles only pop when there's some kind of um, catalyst. Like a virus, maybe? Well, maybe, but I mean... <laughs> Certainly, the the virus caused the market, the stock market, to to crash in March. Obviously, it's it's more well in the US. It's more than recovered from from those lows now. So maybe it'll be the after effects of the virus. I don't know. Maybe this probably quite small shift in policy and reality from the Fed will be the the catalyst that breaks the bond market. I don't know. I mean, the, these catalysts are very hard to to um, to see coming, and they they can be very small things. I mean, that the eighty seven crash was supposedly caused by a kind of off-the-cuff remark during a speech by, I think it was the US Trade Secretary. It, it wasn't, you know, the 2008 crash was, you, you could kind of, in retrospect, see see it coming and and uh, look at the, the causes and they all made a lot of sense. But, you know, the biggest one-day move in, in stock markets ever was was caused by, by one guy saying something that people interpreted slightly differently um, that wasn't really seen as a kind of hugely significant speech at all. So, who knows? I mean, to me, this this change in policy is is pretty innocuous and pretty small. But you know, it may be that in, in ten years' time, Niels, we we look back and we say, "Wow, that that was the catalyst. That was the the day when when um, you know the bond market bubble when Moritz was out." And yeah, exactly. Just talk to miss, about yeah, miss the excitement. So uh, so who knows? It may maybe maybe that is the, the the top. Who knows? You know, I'm I'm very poor at calling tops and bottoms in markets, uh, which is why she say we. We, we trade systematically and we trend follow, which means that we never get the exact top or the exact bottom. We're always a little bit late to the party, but then we hope to ride up or down as it as it turns out. Definitely. Yeah, no, I do want to go in maybe since it's been a few weeks, you've been away, you've been on holiday. Let's talk about how it all, uh, what happened on your side. I'll talk a little bit about what happened on our side this week, but but you're absolutely right. And and I, I will say, and I've said this many times, and so, so uh, please forgive me, for repeating this, but I, I really think that this time in in the quote unquote cycle, we're getting to a point where it really does become important to have diversification across truly uncorrelated return streams in your portfolio, and think outside the classical sixty forty box. And uh, so that that's really my main. I'm not so concerned about which trend follow you pick. I'm more concerned about you pick someone mm -hmm. to take some of that risk in your asset allocation. Anyways, let's talk about not your holiday, but what happened while you were on holiday, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah, in terms of performance, so as, as I normally do, I'll, I'll look at the last week so I can kind of compare it to your numbers just out of curiosity. So last week, um, I was down about 4.6%. And as I've already alluded to, a lot of that came on, on Thursday uh, in reaction to to the, that um, that speech that press release, whatever it was. Um, and my biggest losing market, again, as I've already mentioned, they're all European bonds. So, you know, Italian bonds, BTPs, German bonds, uh, French oats, all down. Also, interestingly, Korean bonds down. So, uh, you know, all of the, all of those losses. And uh, I made some money in, uh, in currencies, Mexican pesos and Aussie dollars. So, you know, some diversification there, overall down, a very big kind of obvious sector loss in in bonds but yeah mostly driven interestingly not by the US bonds or the euro dollars um I, I did have small losses in those but actually by by the european bonds yeah taking a slightly longer picture then to update you from when i, I was last in the building so uh down since we last spoke a bit more so down about 6.6% and um yeah interestingly there much more dispersion. So biggest winning market was actually wheat. My biggest losing market was actually live cattle. And um, 
reasonably good diversification. So, you know, the, the, those kinds of losses of last week actually on the on the longer time frame don't don't look as quite as bad as they were. So, so yeah, for the year I'm I'm still up, but um, you know, my year's been basically um, as I said before, I made pretty decent money in January, and actually since then I've kind of gone sideways. So yeah. Just hanging in there, hoping that there will be a catalyst in the market and, and we'll get a decent, uh, do some decent trends and maybe add a bit more performance before the, the end of the year. Well, November 3rd strikes me as an interesting day for a catalyst. Just, um, oh, you, yeah. You never know. Oh, you goodness me. I, I'm trying not to think about, <laughs> about the outcome of that, that's for sure. Well, you know, the truth is, we may not know the outcome for, I think that's probably the biggest uncertainty is that what if we don't know the outcome of that election? For a while but uh, yeah anyway it was on our side a different we we actually had a good week back in the black for the month uh, still a little bit down for the year on on our side i mean u.s equities obviously they continue to go up so they were good contributors metals did pretty well uh meats did okay for us and and the currencies actually were fine <laughs> interestingly enough what made money for us in the fixed income sector was uh, our short jgb trade which has been Something like um, hasn't worked for decades trying to go short JGBs and now suddenly it's... Yeah, they, they call that trade the widow maker, don't they? Oh my God, yeah. yes, that has been a tough one to do. But anyways, keep doing it and one day it'll work out. It's doing so this year. Now, we did lose money in, in grains uh, and in the US and Australian bonds. Uh, and we also lost money in, in volatility, our volatility program. We lost some ground, still up for the month, but lost some ground doing to some changes in 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 the vol curves. So, and what's been interesting to me, and, and maybe we'll have to talk more about that when the month is over, but since there's only one trading day left, I'm sure the picture won't change. And we'll get to that also when we see how the industry is doing, because there are some changes now. But what's been interesting to me to observe, at least I have, this is my, my feeling, is that some of the quote-unquote simpler trend-following strategies have struggled in August. That's my my get my take my guess, and maybe those who have underperformed a bit earlier in the year, where you basically just had to get in and take the follow through and not have too many bells and whistles in your tra- trend following system, they've actually done. Uh, my feeling is that they've done better in the month of August. At least that's kind of what I see in the market, but also what I see uh, looking inside our engine room a bit. Um, so it kind of goes back to many of our conversations where we talk about the trend following. There are many different ways of doing trend following, even if, even if we say at the same time, there aren't that, that many ways of doing it, but there are still enough ways to, to see some kind of dispersion in returns from time to time. And I think August is one of them, just like we saw maybe in March and maybe in July, possibly as well. So it's a really interesting year, actually, even though we're probably all kind of flattish for the year, plus minus three or four percent. But there's a lot of things going on in the background, in my opinion. Markets, for example, you know, were you in one of those two markets that were just giving you a great trend? I heard Tom Basso speak this week. Uh, He had a great episode with uh, Mip Faber. I haven't finished it yet, but Tom obviously has a lot of experience uh, in the industry and and they were talking about uh, as he was sort of looking back um, and this is probably not something he did recently but when he was more active and looking back at a say one year's performance and looking at all the trades and and he would realize that it was just one or two trades of all the thousands Mm. of trades he may have done that really made the money which goes to some extent to the point about just do the trades and trade as many markets as you can, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really interesting and in, and in, in how we as investors think about the next thousand trades instead of perhaps most investors think about the next trade and okay, how can I maximize the profit on my whatever trade it is? We just think about it as, okay, let's just keep doing another thousand trades and and we know the stats will probably be in our favor. Yeah. I mean, we're basically buying lots of lottery tickets, except that our lottery tickets have a, a positive expectation. And maybe, you know, instead of the odds being a few million to one of getting a prize, they're probably about 40%, maybe. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the, the JGB trade because um, 
that's probably as a futures contract got the low, the largest notional value and and hence you know one of the largest kind of risks which means that um for someone like me with a small account size you know I just can't trade the JGB at all because you know it's got a, a notional of a million dollars and annualized vol yeah. of probably face say 5% so you know it's $50,000 of annualized vol that would that's that would be a huge yeah. chunk of my my kind of uh, my budget my risk budget sure it's interesting. We talked about it before, but there's a real sweet spot for AUM in, in trend following because if, if you haven't got enough money, you can't get enough diversification. That's the spot I'm in. But if you get too big, then you 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 can't put money into the the smaller, less liquid markets like like Moritz likes, you know, your milks and your lumbers and and things like that. Uh, and you have to put more into into things like U.S. government bonds, bond futures. That then gives you then a you know a less diversified portfolio and potentially more idiosyncratic risk if, if something happens to that particular market. I think that the, uh, I don't know about you, I'd love to hear your view, but I think from a, from a, obviously from a professional manager point of view, I think kind of the 500 to 5 billion, so $500 million to a 5 billion or so really is the sweet spot where you don't, I mean, even 5 billion can get a little bit dicey when it comes to the smaller markets to uh, but but still you know or maybe it's three billion or four it doesn't really matter but I think even though a lot of investors a lot of institutional investors prefer the even bigger names and 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 for good reason in the sense that they obviously have shown that they uh, can successfully build big businesses and all of that stuff uh, and that gives comfort for sure but from a pure investment point of view and and let's assume that the managers also know how to run a business and all of that stuff I think you're right I think the sweet spot is is quite narrow in 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 some sense. I'm not sure I'd call it a factor of ten narrow, but <laughs> no, but you know, but no, no, but you see, you see some yeah, managers yeah. at at you know uh, Bridgewater at you know 140 billion, yeah. right? And you see, you know, so I think that's that's an interesting observation. Yeah, I mean, I think the sweet the sweet spot gets bigger when you you go beyond the future space. And um, you know, most of, of the, course, most of the yeah. bigger market uh, bigger managers are also trading single equities. They're trading OTC markets. You know, they're potentially trading options, you know, uh, which arguably is getting a little bit outside their, their comfort zone in terms of, you know, what they know about trading. But uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd certainly say you need a few hundred million minimum to to get um, a good spread of markets diversification wise. And um, yeah, I think when you've got 10 billion, you're probably at the point where you, you be, need to be thinking really carefully about things like your execution, things so that you can really you know, sort of wring the maximum amount of performance and risk budget out of the smaller markets without getting too big and getting to the point where you know you are the market in in, in them which obviously is what your concern is i mean if, if a big a big manager like say winton or ahl allocated say five percent of their risk budget to milk they would become the milk market that would mean that they wouldn't be able to liquidate their positions in the event of a the market turning around and you know that would increase their trading costs their slippage and any benefits from that diversification would, would disappear very quickly. That That's actually another thing that reminds me of another podcast I was listening to this week. And that was a conversation with another conversation with Mike Green. I know Mike has been on our podcast in the Global Macro Series, and he's a, a wealth of, of information and, and so on and so forth. And Mike was talking about how part of the reason why he discovered this whole thing about active and passive and all of that stuff was really he realized and maybe he said that on our podcast as well, that uh, he realized that by looking at some of the Chinese bull markets, he realized that actually there was no trading going on. There's just prices being marked higher all the time and, and people couldn't really trade those moves, but it looked like the markets were in a massive bull market. And I actually think that's interesting, right? Because I think with maybe some of what's going on in the single stock market uh, where some stocks are just taking off completely. I wonder how much volume there really is. And I think that's another factor that, uh, of course, we would argue that trend following and, and the way we do it and, and trading liquid exchange traded futures is really, you know, an enormous benefit that most of the time you don't need that liquidity. But liquidity is so crucial to have at all times and not only 99% of the time. And so I think that, that that's another thing that we might see if we get another crisis at some point is that people realize that the prices that they saw on their stocks uh, that they have been chasing are not necessarily real prices. They're just being marked up on very thin volume. And 
And I think there are a lot of studies out right now that obviously we know the breadth of the market is very thin. It's driven by four or five names pulling up all of the indices. We now have a stock as we talked about uh, that I talked about to to Mort last week. Apple is worth as much as the whole Russell 2000 index, and you know one stock equals the capitalization of of 2000 stocks. I mean, and, and they're not crazy. you know the Russell 2000 is not micro caps either. You know, <laughs> it, it's crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, just talking about kind of mismarking, if you like. I mean, it is like 2008 when the the, the you know these CDSs um, and CDOs and MBSs were actually worth anywhere between zero and 20 cents on the dollar. But the investment banks were still marking them, um, you know, at 95 to 100 cents on the dollar. And, you know, you read about guys like John Paulson saying, well, this is crazy. You know, why, why are you, you, all right, fine, you're marking this at 100, fine. Let's trade at that level. And like, well, well no, we're not going to let you trade at that level, obviously. Right. Um, it's not a real level. It's just, just a level we're using to mark our books so we don't have to realize all of these losses. Uh, and, mm. of course, eventually the, the house of cards just tumbled down. I mean, the interesting thing about the bond market is that individual bonds, especially in the corporate space, don't actually trade that much. Right. You know, in- exactly. individual names don't trade that much. I mean, we're, we're kind of shielded from that because we're trading futures. There is a cheapest to deliver bond out there, and there's, there's usually a reasonable amount of supply of it. Sometimes there's a squeeze and things get a bit weird before um, contracts expiry. But, you know, generally speaking, we, we can just treat it as a kind of reasonably fungible financial instrument. Mm. But... Um, I think one of the interesting things that, that's happened in, in finance is that um, finance is very good at abstracting things and making complicated, difficult problems apparently go away, but actually just hiding them and moving them somewhere. And I think bond ETFs are a good example of this, because I, I can buy a, a corporate bond ETF that has potentially hundreds of names in it, and I can buy and sell it, and the spread's very good, and liquidity's very good, and it's all wonderful. And um, you know, even the Fed is now buying these things, right? So they must be good. But underneath that, there's, there's a, an ETF manager who's, who's had got a very difficult job, which is to maintain a minimum tracking error to some index. And some of these bonds, you know, may only trade once a day, if that. And, and you know, as you say, some of these prices, are they, are they real prices? If only some tiny fraction of, of the, the free float of a, of a company or a bond is, is trading at any given time, does that really tell you what the true true value of something is? I mean, the price of a trade essentially is the price that the two people who happen to want to buy or sell on a given day give to that thing. And it may just so happen that, that you've got um, someone who really, really wants to buy something and there's only one guy who wants to sell and therefore it trades very high on a particular day. That may not be telling you what the market really thinks. I mean, we kind of assume that's the case, right? We kind of assume mm. the market price is the, you know, in economic terms, the kind of collective value that the whole everyone participating in the market ascribes to a particular stock at that time but it, yeah if on any given day the only people trading this stuff are kind of crazy robin hood investors and a few institutional guys saying well this is a great place to get out because the these kind of crazy retail guys have bid this thing up like crazy so i'm i'm very happy to to sell at this level yeah, yeah how meaningful is that yeah that's true i know you used the word crazy but i want to sort of a comment on that a little bit because we got a very nice comment Somehow I, I saw, I can't remember exactly where I saw it, where someone clearly actually appreciated that when we talk about the Robin Hooders, so to speak, we don't necessarily talk about them as being, we don't talk about them in, in, a, in, a, in a negative way other than we use them to describe something that is taking place right now. And that thing might look crazy to us because markets are moving up. But I think I just want to say from my point of view, at least, I don't think that the guys that quote unquote are Robin Hooders are doing anything other than what is actually quite a natural thing for maybe people who are getting into investing. They see and they're tempted by a lot of the 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 information coming through. And obviously someone like a Dave Portnoy who's done a lot to encourage people to just buy stocks and make a lot of money and all of that. I mean he's an interesting guy. I mean, some people think he's completely bonkers, but then when you see him interview Donald Trump, I mean, actually, he held that interview pretty well. So is he acting when he's just sitting in front of his uh, his Twitter feed or whatever it is? He's, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. We all do a bit of that. Right. To be clear, yeah, I, when I said these crazy Robin Hood guys, that was I was saying this is probably what the institutional investor is thinking when they're selling the stock yeah. and the valuation is crazy. I don't personally know anyone who trades on Robinhood, so I'm not really able to say um, whether they're, they're, nope. they're crazy or not. 
I think they're doing something that comes um, where there's a very strong urge when you, when you see something go up every day and it's made so easy, you can do it like with one click on your phone and you're in. It's very natural to say, yeah, I need to do some of that, right? And suddenly you have a few million people doing it and then that becomes the Robin Hooders. But I actually just think that they're doing something which is you know, in all of our DNAs and that is driven by, you know, the the wish to for easy profits. I personally don't believe that that's going to keep going well for people. Uh, I think in the, the at least my 30, 40 years in this industry have told me that it's a little bit more difficult than that. On the other hand, you could say they're just following trends, right? Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, hopefully there'll be some short trades on Robinhood as well at yeah. some point and they'll, they'll clean up. Who knows? Yeah, I mean... The only thing that worries me a bit about Robin Hood is, that the, by the way, there's a very good piece in Forbes, I think it was yesterday, um, which I just started reading this morning on, on Robin Hood that's worth reading. Um, the only thing that worries me a bit about Robin Hood is the options trading. Mm. I think but, that I agree. Yeah, with I think potentially, you know, they're, they're opening up um, leverage, uh, which is something I've written, out, written about a lot yeah. to people who don't really understand what they're doing. And of course, we know there's been one case of a guy who, very sadly, yeah. um, killed himself because he he didn't yeah. understand that the, the the valuation figures he was being given. He thought he'd lost three quarters of a million dollars. I think it was. So that that's the thing that worries me a bit in terms of the Robin Hood's overall effect on the market. I've seen things that say actually the effect is quite small, but I, I think this the potentially of course with options it may be the case that that these guys when they if they start buying options mm-hmm. using the leverage, then of course whoever's delta hedging that option will then be doing probably much larger volume. So actually the indirect effect of Robinhood options trade is probably larger than the direct effect of Robinhood as buying stocks. I actually think that they have quite a lot to say at this stage of of the bull market. I think that that what Mike Green observed uh, about the passive and all of that, I think that led to a lot of the big chunk of the bull market from, you know, uh, 2010 and, 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 and onwards. And I think as that effect probably veins a little bit. I think Robin Hooders have been there to pick up the baton and just continue to push markets higher. And that feeds into you know, rebalancing and all of those things that just keeps everything going up. So a lot of this is driven by kind of flows and, and indiscriminate buying, not thinking too much about price because it's going to be higher tomorrow. So who cares? That also means I think that the other side of that trade, once it turns and once the flow starts to turn, I think we can see more of these incredibly quick and very sharp and deep corrections slash bear markets as well. I have to move on because time is flying and I have a question from Mike who I've been putting off for about like six weeks since you were last on. I don't think I can justify not posing this question anymore. So Mike, thanks for your patience. We finally got to it. Rob is here and let's let's uh, let's do it. So Mike writes, about a month ago, so this is probably like three months ago now, Rob and Moritz were talking about noise in data. I wanted to ask if anyone was aware of any trend followers or systematic investors using something like a Black Litterman portfolio optimization framework to combat estimation error as a result from noise in historical data. What I'm referring to is the specific step where the framework adjusts weights from a benchmark, which could be the acid weights from the system before the framework is applied, and then applies a discount factor to those weights referred to as tau in the original framework to discount weights for measurement error. Thanks for your input. So now uh, <laughs> you probably lost a lot of our listeners. A lot of people uh, Mike, just but, look, off, but, yeah. but hopefully you haven't lost you haven't lost Rob on at this point. So Rob, maybe you can dis, dis maybe you can talk about this in 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 broader terms to make sure everyone is yeah. Is following so along. actually, to be honest, I really like Black Litterman. In fact, um, if you asked me ten years ago about whether anyone I knew was using it, in fact, I was using it myself in my institutional portfolio at the time, which was a kind of cross-asset global macro, global tactical asset allocation portfolio that I was running for AHL at the time. So what is Black Litterman? So um, in simple terms, if you think about the kind of classic way that financial economists like to do portfolio optimization, 
they've estimated some correlations and some standard deviations and, and some expected returns, and they plug it all into this optimizer. And 99.9% um, of the time, the optimizer produces junk. And by that, I mean it'll produce extreme weights, so it'll put everything into one market and zero and everything else, because you know that, that's what the mathematics tells it to do. And there's been a number of attempts to, to correct um, this problem and, and, and to sort of do things in a more sensible way. And the way the Black Litterman guys did it was to say the following. In the absence of any other information, um, you should hold this thing called the market portfolio, right, which is this kind of imaginary portfolio that, that contains all the assets um, you, you'd hold in, in market capitalization weights. So that if, you know, if you buy the S&P 500, that's like a market portfolio. And, and the logic for doing that is to say, well, if we assume, and we've already discussed this, that kind of share prices are all fair and correct and represent the best estimate of everyone on the planet, it's a pretty good starting point to assume that, you know, if, say, the market thinks that 10% of your money should be in, say, Apple, then as a starting point, without knowing anything else, you should put 10% of your money in Apple. Okay. So you, you, you start with, with the market portfolio. Then what you do is you say, what expected returns are implied by that portfolio. So if Apple obviously has a bigger weight than, than say, um, I don't know, um, Facebook in your portfolio, that implies that all of the things being equal, you have a higher expected return estimate for Apple than you do for Facebook. And the way you do that is you take the classic kind of normal portfolio optimization equation, which basically takes um, expected returns um, standard deviations and correlations, and produces portfolio weights, and you run it backwards. So you start with portfolio weights, you start with the market portfolio weights, and you run the equation backwards. The standard deviations and the correlations you use with the estimates you have. So basically, you then you can then imply what the expected return should be, and that's a sensible thing to do because um, we're we're pretty good at estimating correlations and standard deviations, and they're fairly predictable actually as well. So now what you have is a bunch of expected returns. And basically, the assets that have the biggest weight, ignoring the effects of correlation and risk, you know, the assets that have the biggest weight, so your apples, will have the highest expected return. And the assets that have the, the smallest weight will have the lowest expected returns. Now what you do is say, OK, I think I can do better than the market at predicting expected returns. So you go and you find someone else or something that's going to give you some other forecasts of expected returns. And that could be, for example, and then in the original paper, Black Litterman said, well, you could ask your, your portfolio analysts. So, you know, at the time, there, were, you know, there wasn't really so much systematic trading, but you'd have a bunch of guys who were all analyzing these companies and they would say, well, actually, I really like Apple or I really, and I really dislike Facebook, or the, which is what the market says. And they may disagree and say, you know, what? I think Facebook is great and Apple is not so good. And they would give you a different set of expected returns to that. Or you could do it with a systematic model. You could say, well, what's the momentum and the value factors doing for all of these stocks? And, you know, what expected returns are implied by that? Or you could do um, through its uh, so-called alpha capture system, which means you would basically ask a bunch of very smart people working in um, investment banks and so on around around the industry and say, what, what's your earnings forecast for Apple and, and Facebook and so on? And you plug that in doesn't really matter where, where you get those, those numbers from. Obviously, we would probably naturally do it by perhaps looking at something like the relative momentum of the stocks in the S&P 500. That would be the most natural thing for us to do, perhaps. Anyway, it doesn't matter where the, those numbers come from. So then what you do is you basically combine those two sets of expected returns. And so you can, you're basically blending them together and taking an average of them, a weighted average. So you could just take a 50-50 average. In other words, you give just about as much weight to the ret returns implied from the market portfolio as you would to the other set of returns you've got from your analysts or your, your system or whatever. Or you could give a lot more weight to the market and less to the system and, and so on and so forth. So now I have a single set of expected returns that's basically a blended average of the returns from those two sources. And now what I do is I get my portfolio optimizer, I get my, my correlations and my standard deviations, and I run the whole thing forward the normal way through my optimizer. And that's then going to produce some portfolio weights. Now, those portfolio weights are basically going to look not dissimilar from the market portfolio, 
but they will be moved around depending on what my other set of expected returns has said. So for example, if my, my analyst or my system is really bullish on um, Facebook and less so on Apple, the weight of Facebook will increase in my final portfolio compared to how it started in the, in the market portfolio. And this tau factor is, is uh, the, 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 um, that Mike, was Mike, right? The tau, yeah, that, yeah, Mike. the tau that Mike mentioned is basically um, a, a number you can tweak between zero and one that tells you how much of your expected returns coming from the market portfolio and how much is coming from this other source. And the idea is that, that you, you kind of tweak this tau depending on a number of things. So for example, if you have a lot of conviction um, that your, you know, your system's really good, you might want to put a higher weight on it. The other thing, though, is that the, the level of tau will, will affect how robust your portfolio optimization is. So if, you, if you're putting a lot less weight on the market portfolio, it's more likely that the optimizer will fall into its bad ways and start producing very extreme weights again. So, um, you know, if you play with this thing a lot, you'll find that generally tau has to be at a level where it's allocating usually quite a lot to the original market portfolio. You don't really need very much coming in from your, your system or your analyst estimates to affect what the portfolio looks like. And Neil, as I can tell from your face, you probably have some questions now. No, no. I, I Actually, what I wanted to say is that, Mike, I hope you really, it was worth the wait, right? I mean, you, you've been waiting for six weeks and here you get such a, a detailed answer from Rob. But it's not really an answer because I haven't actually answered the question of, do people use it? I've just explained it, right? Because Right. Okay. So exp- yeah. explanation of what it is. So, so yeah. Because Mike, I think, so, understands what it is already. He's, he's yes. just fast forwarded through this bit. Yeah. So do people use it? I hear you ask, Mike. So it's probably not used so much in our area of the industry, because I don't know about you, Niels, but but we don't generally do this kind of classic portfolio optimization so much. There are some CTAs that do it. I know I know some kind of large US CTAs that do it. I'm not allowed to mention who they are, but um, there are some. So they will have um, a model where um, they do actually start with a bunch of trading systems that produce expected returns, and they push them into an optimizer, and then that will produce you know, a series of, of portfolio weights. It's kind of geared more towards a long-only portfolio, I think, because you start with this market mm. portfolio, which is by its nature a long-only portfolio. It's a bit harder to say what the market portfolio should be for a bunch of futures. It's very hard to say, you know, do you, do you look at the market cap of gold and the market cap of corn? I mean, what is the market cap of corn? I'm not even sure that makes sense. <laughs> but it, but um, it certainly makes more spend, sense in a, if you're doing a kind of active long-only equity portfolio or even an active long-only equity portfolio with a maybe with a hedge on the future side to get yourself equity neutral. Um, yeah. So where, where you are using this kind of traditional optimization method, Black Litterman is a good way um, of making sure that optimization works in, in a good way. You know, what it's really aimed at is the guy who's running a long-only fund and has a benchmark, you know, so your benchmarks against the S&P so your investors aren't really expecting you to have weights that look radically different from the S&P, but you need a kind of good, robust way of adjusting that portfolio such that it reflects a bit more of what your expectations are for stock returns rather than and a bit less of what the, the S&P is implying. So running this kind of process will is very good if you want to, to have a portfolio that basically looks pretty much like the S&P, except that you've got a, you know an overweight to Facebook and underweight to Apple and so on and so forth. At the risk of sounding incredibly ignorant uh, on this point, Rob, I wonder, do you think market cap for what we do could be reflected by just open interest? Yeah. Actually, of futures? Yeah, I mean, there are people, because people have tried to do this. Yeah. Um, and uh, open interest is, is, is one good way of doing it, um, definitely. Because it reminds me of our conversation with Eric Crittenden, and I think he weights his risk based on open interest. And I kind of get a feeling that maybe he's also been looking at these things. I don't know. Yeah, just it makes sense. But yeah. So just, just to finish the, the conversation and yeah. to, answer, to explain, because I said earlier I was using it in, in what was actually a long, short um, futures portfolio. I was actually using it um, for something it wasn't designed to be useful. So both Black and Litterman would be, be horrified. <laughs> but I was basically <laughs> using the maths to, to do something which was you know, quite different from its intended purpose. And basically what I did was I started with a long short futures portfolio, which had been produced by my trading systems. And uh, and then what I did was I, I did the Black Bitumen exercise. So I 
got expected returns. But then when I went forward through the optimizer again, what I did this time was apply constraints. So things like liquidity caps, you know, open interest caps, caps on emerging market exposure, things like that. And that's a very neat way of, of applying constraints because um, normally constraints make optimizers do horrible things. So I, I, I knew if, if I started with a portfolio that was, was, was sensible but didn't have constraints applied to it and then did this kind of forwards and backwards optimization that's basically using the, the maths of Black Litterman, although not for its original purpose, I would end up with a portfolio that was as close as I could get to the portfolio I wanted in terms of long, short futures exposure, but, would, for example, may have reduced my weight in, say, Italian bonds because the open interest wasn't there at the time. So there we go. Yeah. Cool. Great stuff. Thanks for your question, Mike. Thanks for your patience, but I hope it was all worth it. Another question from uh, another Mike, interestingly enough. We have a lot of Mikes listening to our show. We have lots of Mikes, yeah. Actually, I think it is Michael, but he called himself Mike. Here's a question from him. Suppose I run two trading systems, a breakout system and a moving average system. Would you prefer to run them separately, which makes it easier for testing and makes you more aware of what's going on? Or would you combine both systems to generate signals? In this case, you use more information to generate signals and thus the signals could be, quote unquote, better. I'll start with you uh, to hear your view on that, Rob, and, and then I'll have my own observations. Um, so I'm not sure that using them together would necessarily be better. Um, I think theoretically it wouldn't really matter if you ran the systems separately or together in terms of performance. Now, there are some caveats to that. So one might be trading costs, for example. So it could be that if you're running them separately, you can end up in situations where one system starts buying in the morning and the other one starts selling in the afternoon. And if you'd been running them together, it might, you know, it's possible that the forecast blended together would, would have produced no trade at all during that day. So that's extra transaction costs you would have paid. I personally like to combine things together into four signals or forecasts and then and then basically trade the positions implied by those. I think the comment about it being easier to see to test them if you've run them separately, I think if you've got kind of decent backtesting software and you you can actually isolate what individual systems are doing and then bring them together to see what the overall system's doing you you could normally do that quite easily so um i think the other thing is if if you're trading in in a more manual way then i would imagine that trading two systems separately is probably a lot more work because you 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 know you're kind of having to do a lot of the steps that you have to do twice over whereas if if you're running them as a kind of blended signal then you obviously have to generate two sets of signals and combine them but then you're you just then got to do the same job for for that one system so for me personally um I, I generally always blend things together that's true basically if they are doing the same kind of thing so by that i mean trading the same instruments in the same kind of way um, with the same kind of time scale so if, if that isn't true, so for example, if you're trading, say, a slower trend-following system with a faster mean reverting system, it may make sense to trade those separately with, with maybe some netting going on between the trades. Um, similarly, you know, if you're trading, say, I don't know, um, rel relative value systems, so something that's trading, say, the curve in, in euro dollars, it probably makes sense to trade that separately from mm. an outright euro dollar system because you know, the kinds of trades being generated and stuff. Uh, it's just, you know, the risk management's going to look different and um, the time scale is going to look different. It, you know, so I'd imagine that a, a breakout and a moving average system are similar enough that it would make sense to combine them. That's that's my opinion anyway. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think you're, first of all, you're, I think you make a really good point here at the end. I mean, I think that if, if you consider running things, you know, like, like uh, Mike uh, suggests, they have to be calibrated uh, to to in the same way, right? Meaning, if you're running an end of day moving average system and an end of day breakout system, fine, you can definitely. Need, but but again, I would say depends on how we talk about these terms, right? So I would always run them separately, but it doesn't mean that I would implement them separately, right? I would do as you suggest. Okay, so you run them separately, you can see what's going on, but then when it comes to the actual trades, clearly, if one system says buy 10 and the other one says sell 10, you do nothing. Yeah. You go, don't do both, right? So so I think it's the implementation that you can combine if the systems are, quote unquote, calibrated to to do so. 
but I would always run them separately. And what you could do then, Mike, is is another thing, and that is from the actual in, in implementation point of view, you don't have to give them equal weight. I mean, if you think that, for example, a moving average system is quote unquote better than uh, a breakout system in the long run, that if your day, if your research suggests that, well, by all means, weight them in that favor for sure. Uh, it doesn't have to be equal. I think that could be an interesting conversation, by the way, generally speaking, on another day, and that is, are there some trend-following methodologies that are better than others? I don't know. I've never done the, the research per se, but I have experience with different kinds and and so on and so forth. But combining different types of trend-following uh, methodologies, I'm, I'm a big proponent for. I think that makes a lot of sense because, as, as we talked about early in this conversation, this year have shown you that some systems did better in the early part of the year and now other types of trend following is doing better in the latter, in, in the current environment. So I think combining uh, things uh, makes a lot of sense. Like we combine time frames and, and all of that stuff and, and markets. Yeah. But I completely agree with you. Once you start moving into relative value yeah. and, and all of that stuff, you can't combine those uh, with trend when it comes to, to signals. Yeah. I'll make a couple of just quick further points. Um, yeah. I think that point about how you distribute your money amongst systems is really important because I think if you were to trade things completely separately, it might be that, that like me, you have a lot of systems and individually none of them would actually produce any trade, <laughs> especially if you've got a small amount of capital. Or it might be that perhaps you, you're you adding a system in just quite a small weight. So you might have 90% of your money in trend following and 10% in something else. That 10%, if you traded it individually, wouldn't potentially produce any positions or would have very coarse position sizing. By combining things together, you can basically have something that very much looks like a trend following system with just a little bit of an influence from this other system without without having to trade it separately. I think the other thing is we're, we're really, I think, we, I think we agree we should combine systems. It's just a question of at what stage in your process you do it. So I'm perhaps leaning to more towards an early stage in the process where you're talking about kind of abstract signals and combining those. You know, you're saying well, later in the process you should be you can combine the trades and net the trades off. You know, it's it's partly a matter of preference, partly a matter of, so for example, it's it's easier to um, see the PNL from individual systems if you go right to positions and combine trades. If you're doing it at the forecast level, then there's a bit more work to be done because you have to kind of pretend that you were trading in you know, all of your money on a given signal, and, and it's not really realistic. But um, but yeah, generally speaking, combining things is good. Where you combine them, you know, is partly preference, partly what makes sense for the systems you're using. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. So I want to move on just to maybe the last question, uh, questions of, 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 of today's episode is a, a couple of uh, questions that you got via Twitter. So I don't know actually who they're from, so I apologize about that. Probably from people called Mike, I would imagine. <laughs> Could well be, you never know. So the first one, um, and I think you have posed the question that, you know, what should we talk about uh, today? And uh, so the first one uh, is, um, I'd be interested to hear the update on the idea you mentioned on the podcast a few months ago of using forecast strength to select which markets to trade. So you can trade more markets in a smaller account size with the recent move in system trade and work involved there. I understand there might not be any updates on the idea, though. So I think he's referring to some maybe some content you've uh, put out actually ties into the discussion about small capital size. So I apologize if I don't know the context yeah. of this, but I'm sure you do. Yeah, so I mean, I spend quite a bit of time thinking about how you should do this stuff with a smaller account size because, you know, I'm now right. trading only my own money. But also, generally speaking, I think... Um, there's obviously a lot of people out there who don't have the the five hundred million dollars that we we said was the bare minimum I'm sure to run a, a decent yeah. size system. I'm, I'm I'm afraid I'm not quite running that sort of money myself now. Although obviously in in the past I was uh, in the multi billion dollar camp. So yeah, I mean we we kind of touched on it today when I said I I couldn't have a position in JGBs because mm. of the the sheer size of the thing. But um, the the idea behind this um, is um, to say well actually I could calculate what my position in JGBs could be and in actually in in you know in 100 or 150 other futures markets you could I could do that calculation and then what I need to do is is say well actually given the constraints I have and the amount of limited capital I have what is the best way of implementing that trade 
And it might be that, um, I don't know, Korean 10-year bonds, um, which I can and do trade, are fairly correlated to JGBs, I would imagine. And uh, the, so what actually you should do in practice is potentially increase your position in Korean 10-year bonds to kind of say, well, this is basically like my position in Korean 10-year plus a sort of JGB proxy trade, if you like. So that's the idea. And, and it's really a question of implementation. And interestingly, interestingly, one way of doing it is to use the Black Litterman idea we've already discussed. Mm. So what one thing you, you could do is start, say, well, here's a theoretical portfolio, which I can't, I know I can't hold because it's got positions in 150 futures markets. I now do this forwards and backwards optimization. And when I do the, the forwards optimization to see what my positions really should be, I then say, well, here's a whole bunch of constraints saying basically, well, I can't trade JGBs. I can only take integer positions in certain markets and so on and so forth. So that actually is is the kind of idea I'm working on, although I won't probably be using um, the explicit Black Litterman method because it is still using this portfolio optimization method that's not especially robust. So I'm actually going to be using something very much cruder, which is a, essentially a brute force approach because, you know, we, we're talking about in numbers terms, it, it, the, the, the sort of decision it should have is it say zero, one or two or maybe three Korean 10-year bonds. Across, across that means then the number of kind of points I have to look at is small enough that I can do a brute force search that essentially looks across, you know, all possible outcomes, if you like, because, you know, we can only hold integer futures contracts. There's only a discrete number of possible portfolios you can hold. Um, and then there is potentially some smart, smarter things you can do to, for example, start optimizing and say, well, here's roughly the kind of portfolio I want I don't need, now need to search every possibility. I just need to search in the region of this portfolio and things like that. So, yeah, it's a kind of ongoing research piece. And uh, thanks for um, bringing it up so I can talk about it. But uh, there hasn't been any tangible progress. But um, it's kind of it links into some of these interesting ideas about you know how you can construct portfolios using slightly more off-the-wall ideas like Black Litterman, potentially. Yeah, I mean, and I think another related discussion is this thing about uh, which we often get into that discussion that is which market should we trade yeah. and where obviously jerry and Moritz just keep adding markets yeah. and 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 obviously with some constraints i'm aware of that but kind of that's kind of one way of looking at it and the, the other way is maybe and, and and i think we talked about this before and that is should we have like a big universe of markets and then have some kind of filtering that actually selects the live portfolio of markets if we have constraints that could be another way you could even and you could do, do it a third way and say well we trade all the markets but based on their historical uh, to make it very crude profitability i trade smaller those markets that haven't really worked for a while and i trade bigger the ones that have done really well so uh, we talked about that a bit in the in the past as well yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that um, i do do a little bit of it but statistically it's quite hard to infer from historical returns what future returns should be so you shouldn't get carried sure. away there but interestingly that this this idea of kind of optimizing a portfolio given constraints applies equally well to to a lot to a multi-billion dollar manager mm. because you know they're the theoretical portfolio they would like to hold they can trade all of these markets that's not the issue the issue they have is that if they try to trade say milk in the same size as us 10-year bonds They've right. become all of the market, as we've already discussed. So it, it may be that some kind of dynam dynamic optimization where that that you know large futures manager says, well, this is the portfolio I'd like to hold, where you know something like milk has got a pretty decent risk weight. But actually, this is the portfolio I can hold because I can't actually have that much milk. That sort of kind of the maths isn't that different in terms of how you actually solve that problem as to how a smaller trader solves a, a different problem, which is, well, this is the portfolio I'd like to hold, but actually I, have, I don't have that much capital. So the problems are different, but you can actually bring similar techniques and insights to solving both of them. It's trying to avoid ending up with a milkshake when the crisis <laughs> happens, right? Okay, let's get back to the serious <laughs> part of this podcast. That's what my, my children would call a dad joke. <laughs> now, there's another, I think it's from maybe the same Twitter follower you have. He writes, one or two of the previous hosts have often argued that institutional investors should allocate a much higher percentage of their assets to trend following. If memory serves me correctly, 
they might have even suggested that perhaps the majority of capital should be invested using trend-following strategies. I'm sure that's Jerry's uh, talk. <laughs> Seems likely, here. doesn't it? Uh, yeah. If this were to happen, wouldn't the trend-following risk premium disappear? Fair question. So what's your view? Can we have too much of a good thing, even if it's trend-following? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, personally, I have about 25% of my assets in trend-following. And um, I would be surprised if there were many people out there that 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 had more than that, you know. So, you know, the more than half is is pretty pretty ambitious, I think. Yeah. So th- this is kind of an, an an interesting thing, and it gets into quite a philosophical discussion. And and um, I think it, when I was teaching in London, I week two of my lecture is titled "Where Do Returns Come From." So, you know, I think people naively assume that, that trading essentially is this kind of thing where you, you can only make money by being smart and by capturing what people call alpha. And that leads into this idea that, that, that you know, um, you have alpha decay and you can only sort of exploit inefficiencies for a while before someone, you know, a lot of people get into that trade and take it away from you. And there's a, there's a view that all trading is like that. But actually, I think most trading is actually earning money from risk premia. That's my opinion. So just buying stocks means you're, you're earning money through a risk premia, which is the, you know, the, the, the premium that stocks have because they're a risky asset. Owning bonds, you're, you're basically earning a premium because you're, you know, you're essentially lending money to somebody. And because of the, the, the fact that the, you know, you're, you're giving that to them and you'll get it back in the future, you really ought to be paid something for that privilege. Although uh, the German government. Unless you live in yeah, Europe. exactly. The Danish government and the German government think differently, obviously, at the moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, 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 the more sort of esoteric premium like value, momentum, of course, which is what, you know, we, we make a lot of our money from. So the, the thing about risk premium is there's something that, that will always exist because they exist because there are people in the market that think about risk one way and there are people that think about the market, risk in the market another way. And there's generally a majority of people who think about risk in one particular way. Um, so, for example, through most of history, if you look at, you know, analyze returns, most people don't like holding p- portfolios that contain sort of momentum assets uh, because they have this preference, which is sort of hardwired into our brains, to um, take profits early and to let losses run. And, of course, momentum trades do the exact opposite of that. So people just do not like holding momentum portfolios. And therefore, they're essentially willing to pay like an insurance premium or risk premium to people who don't care about that. And, um, you know, with the people who run systems with computers, of course, computers don't have any of these emotional failings. They're happy to collect uh, the, the risk premium from momentum. Now, the thing about earning money through risk premium is that it's risk premium generally are not big returns. You know, they're not like three sharp ratio systems. They're much lower than that, and they will tend to go through cycles as well. So you'll you'll get years, especially with momentum, you'll you'll get one or two years when it does really well, and then a few years when it's flat or even loses money. And during those few years, of course, all you know people get bored of the systems and deallocate from them. We we all know the story and complain and and so on and so forth. Particularly when other asset classes are doing really well, and everyone runs articles in papers saying like is momentum dead or is value dead or is is insert name of risk premium here dead? And the answer is, of course, no. And it's it's not really gone away. It's just that because the the return stream isn't that big, it's going to be times when it's it's very low, and it's times when it's a bit higher. On average, it's kind of okay. And generally speaking, the the way you earn it is by diversifying across as many different sources of it as possible, and across as many risk premiums as possible. And so, generally speaking, something like earning money from a momentum system is quite different from, say, an, an HFT strategy, a higher frequency trading strategy, where maybe the guy has, has done some fancy you know, machine learning and has discovered an anomaly in, in the markets and the way the markets are trading, and for potentially a few weeks or even a few months, is able to capture that inefficiency and, and do very well and make very high sharp ratios. But that effect will go away. That that kind of thing does exist in the markets, but I'd you know most most money that's earned in markets is earned through collecting risk premium and maybe and trying to do it in a smart way, you know, with, with portfolio construction and all these things we talked about, good position sizing, all this kind of stuff. But ultimately, you know, uh, you know when we're trading momentum, we're, we're basically mostly just picking up a premium that the rest of the market is willing to pay for us. So I, I think, you know, the idea that this will go away, I don't think it will. 
the, 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 the more interesting question is, if everyone is doing it, will it go away? And um, I think there's a, there's a difference here between something like the momentum premium and the value premium. You know, you can imagine a situation in which everyone just just reads, um, you know, the classic papers uh, Farmer French wrote and says, "Well, really, we should we shouldn't be buying Tesla, and uh, we should be buying, you know, stocks that have good price book ratios, good price earnings ratios, good dividend yields, and so on and so forth." And of course, then what will happen is the price of those stocks will be bid up. The prices of stocks that look expensive, growth stocks will be forced down. They will converge. And the, the the returns you can earn from owning those cheap stocks will be reduced. So the, the value premium is very cyclical in that sense because there are times when value had very high expected returns. So the end of the tech bubble in 2000 would be an excellent example where obviously the market as overall was very expensive, but the, you know, the, the tech stocks that had been bid up were, were very, very overpriced compared to the value stocks that had been left behind. And that then corrected itself. And prob- I think, you know, at the moment as well, we're really seeing that. And um, a great barometer is is not even to look at the value spread, but just count up how many times the phrase value is dead is mentioned in a in a Bloomberg article or something. And we're, we're seeing a lot of that at the moment. Or so, trend following is dead. Or, I see, well, that's, or trend yeah. following. But this uh, this is the key difference, right? Because I it's not, you don't, in, in value, you have this very simple mathematical equation that the more people buy the cheap stocks, the more the value premium will narrow. In, tr- in trend following, that's not the case. It's a- actually, to an extent, it's self-reinforcing. The more momentum traders there are in the market, the more me- you know, the, the more momentum the will happen. Bigger the trends. And going back to our early discussion, that is exactly what we're seeing in the stock market with these Robin Hood guys, who are all very much momentum players. And it is like being you know, in a time machine and being in late 1999. You know, people are just buying stuff that's gone up. They don't even actually 20 years ago, people were buying stuff and they didn't even know what the company did. Perhaps the difference now is the Robin Hood guys are actually being a bit more selective and sticking to the stocks that they know and understand, like Tesla and Apple and so on. They're staying away from from the junk. Maybe I don't know. Maybe this hurts, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I was just going to say. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that that's my kind of take on it. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. I have a simpler way of looking at. Yeah. It. Please do, because that was quite a complicated way. So. No, 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 no. I mean, it's good and it's right, and 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 so. The way I look at it is, is slightly different. Let's just, for, first of all, I think a lot of people, it's very hard to define, by the way, how many people do trend following, right? Because if you look at our industry, I think the official number is something like $270 billion in CTAs. But take out Bridgewater and you're down to about $150 billion. I mean, I don't consider Bridgewater uh, as a CTA or a trend follower or anything like that. Then in the CTA industry, let's just, you know, that's, that includes more than trend followers. So let's take that even further down and you probably end up with, say, $120 billion uh, doing trend following as a CTA. Now, that doesn't mean that there's only $120 billion in the world doing trend following because I think a lot of people actually use trend following techniques because what every investor more or less is interested in is capturing a price move and that is could be defined as a trend doesn't matter whether it's five minutes or it's five months or five years. So trend following is a very broad concept in many ways. So what would happen if investors suddenly saw the light and said, I need 25% of my portfolio uh, like Rob in trend following? Of course, the number, official number would go up significantly. And as you said, that could mean that you get bigger moves in some ways. But here's the thing we're not the ones buying at the end of a trend, right? We're the ones buying at the beginning of a trend. I'm not even sure that the trends necessarily would be bigger. What I could see happening if there were a lot of people using, quote unquote, the same trend following techniques, I could see that that things like exits would become more important because you don't want to get out when everyone else is getting out. That's probably where you would lose some of your edge and so on and so forth. So I don't worry about trend following becoming popular. First of all, I don't think it will. After 35 years of doing this, I don't think it really will become popular to that extent because people still can't get around in their head that you can actually make money for decades by buying high and selling higher and selling low and buying back at a lower price. It's too simple for many people to believe that that really works. So that's not going to happen, I think. But it could happen that more people, hopefully, before the next crisis, realize that they should have some trend following in their portfolio. So let's hope for that. Now, 
all I think it means for us as managers is we need to stay on top of our game and we need to keep doing research. We need to keep evolving. We need to become smarter at what we do. Like any, any whether it's an athlete who wants to win the world championship, et cetera, et cetera, you always have to improve what you do. You can't just stick with what worked 30 years ago, I think. So that's all I think it really means that, that those who are good at doing that and, 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 and keep evolving – they will continue to perform and and there will be some people who will lack behind and, and maybe not produce the same returns as they used to do if suddenly you have a massive inflow of trend following money. So but I don't worry about it. I think that it would be great for the underlying investors if they did allocate more to trend. Just simply because, again, we a lot of what we say, by the way, in in at least well, you can you can differ on this one, Rob. But a lot of what 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 we talk about is not really opinions. A lot of it is based on facts. The fact is that if you add a non-correlated tr- return stream to your portfolio, it will improve your risk-adjusted returns. And so, it's not that we're trying to always impose our opinions on 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 those of you listening. A lot of this is based on the evidence uh, that we have. Uh, so um, that's how I think about the risk of that. Yeah, I think I think it's a mathematical fact that you should have some trend following in your portfolio. Yeah. The thing we can debate is is whether that should be 1%, 5%, 10%, 25%. Yeah. I think it's unlikely that, that um, you know, 30, 40, 50% is, is, is going to be um, optimal from a you know, purely fact-based point of view unless you've got quite high expectations for your trend following performance or quite low expectations for your long only performance. But, um, you know, one of our peers in, in the industry who's also been around a long time, they did a study where they said, what would happen if we ran a million different portfolios and we included 30% trend in that? And you know how many of those 1 million uh, portfolios actually improve returns by including 30% trend? I'm going to guess. Um, I'm going to say 950,000. One million. <laughs> so again, as I said, a lot of what we're trying to promote is really just the evidence of of, of this and uh, sprinkled with a little bit of opinion once in a while, of course. Anyways, this was great, by the way, Rob. Great to have you back after your uh, quarantine and holiday and all of that good stuff. Um, you'll be back uh, in a few weeks, of course. So uh, as usual, send questions to us info at toptradersonplug.com. We love these questions. It gives us something to uh, get into and, and hopefully to the benefit of you. For those of you who already forgotten what I mentioned in the beginning, but we really would love uh, a rating and review in, in iTunes. So just head over to toptradersonplug.com forward slash review and, and get all the details. Now let me talk to you about the performance, uh, which has changed. I mean, as I said, it has been a little bit of an interesting week. So from being in the positive, most trend-following strategies or, and, and CTA strategies are now actually down for the month of August. So beta 50 down 72 basis points, down 60 basis points for the year. The SOCGEN CTA index is down almost 2% for the month, and that's also pretty much the yearly return, so down 2% for the year. Trend index uh, having a little bit of a rough month, down 2.5% and down 37 basis points for the year. The SOCGEN uh, Short-Term Traders Index down 73 basis points, still up 2.8% for the year. The Bridge Alternatives Index, I mean, it's down for the month, I know that, but it's actually not updating as as frequently as it used to do, so I don't want to quote it too closely. And of course, for those of you who uh, also have a few equities in your portfolio, you would have a good uh, month. Uh, the MSCI World is up 6.59% and is now up 4% for the year. While the bonds, um, as alluded to earlier in this conversation, the world government bond index is actually down 1.12% month to date as we speak on this Saturday, almost at the end of the month. By the way, we published a great episode with Lynn Alden this week on in our Global Macro Series. Another great one coming up uh, next week that you should tune into. But Lynn was really a an extraordinary guest and probably one of the sharpest analysts out there of 2020. I think she gets a lot of credit for really having done some amazing work. And I think uh, our conversation with her reflects that. So do go and check that out. Any final thoughts, uh, Rob, before we wrap up? 
No, it's been a good discussion, although uh, I will admit that even, I hate to say it, but uh, I, I do actually miss Moritz. So they, <laughs> when you listen to this, Moritz, be, be assured that although we've managed, just about managed without you, but you know, it's not quite the same. Exactly. And, and, and uh, yeah, so as, as you lie down by the uh, whatever swimming pool you're at, Moritz, hope you enjoy it and we'll wait for you to be back in a couple of weeks. To all of you listening out there, thanks so much for uh, being with us for another episode. We really do appreciate it. And we can't wait to be back with you uh, next week. In the meantime, and by the way, I may have a surprise guest next week. Someone uh, who has been on the show before, but who will be back. And uh, I think, I hope you will enjoy this where we dive deep into kind of the research mode of trend following. So come back next week. In the meantime, Stay well, be safe, and we look forward to speaking next week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.